So I'm not going to labour the point that I'm the only thing standing between you and breakfast. Okay? So I'm really not going to talk about breakfast very much at all, let alone put up pictures of breakfast, because that would be a really evil thing to do. Okay? So I'm not going to do that. Okay? So I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I work in the Government Digital Service. Um, hands up, people who know what the Government Digital Service is, you've heard of us. Oh, there's a few people who've heard of us. Excellent. Um, so, Government Digital Service. Who are we? What are we? So, as the name implies, we're government. We're part of the government, part of the civil service, part of the cabinet office, actually. And about four years ago, Francis Maud, who's now the Minister of the Cabinet Office, asked Martha Lane Fox to look at how we could use digital to transform the delivery of public services. Because there's this weird thing happening, which is... Digital transformation is affecting everything. Everything in the world is being affected by digital transformation. You know, my favourite exa recent example is if someone had told you, even a year ago, that someone would be going to court to claim back $25,000 which they had invested in an imaginary currency on a Magic the Gathering online exchange, you would have thought, no, 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 no. This would never, ever happen. And lo and behold, what's happening? Someone's going to court to reclaim $25,000, which they invested in Bitcoin on Magic the Gathering online exchange. Digital affects everything which we're doing. It's affecting shopping, it's affecting transport, it's affecting how we work, how we live. Everything has been transformed by digital. Everything it, that seemed apart from public services. In particular, in the technology space. So in the technology space, government IT projects... So, actually, let's do a test. Who would associate the word success with government IT projects? <laughs> I'm not picking up a lot of... Yeah. Um, so there was also this interesting point about cost. See? In technology, prices fall. We can get more for our money. We can achieve more. We can do more. The odd thing was that in the public sector, costs around IT only seemed to go in one direction, which was up. And we reached a stage where we were spending something of the order of £14 billion pounds a year on IT. Now, I don't know about you, but a £14 billion pound a year market should be a kind of dynamic, diverse thriving entrepreneurial market, lots of new entrants, lots of people involved in it. Instead, we ended up with a market which was dominated by an oligopoly, a small number of very big suppliers. Okay? And that's not a good place to be in. So, Martha said, and you really should read a report, it's very short, it's only a couple of pages. What she said is, start with the user, start with what people need, and create a new function in government, government digital services it now is, to actually take that user focus and respond to it in an agile, iterative way. To use open standards, open source, the wider community to transform how we deliver responses to people's needs. That's where GDS have come from. And we started with a series of principles. Okay? Because it's, it's easy to write big, long documents and get lost in thinking about, oh, well, should we do a bit more of this, a bit less of that? What's the most important thing? So we started off with a number of principles. Okay? We've just got seven principles which define what we try and do. And they're on our website. If you go to the uh, GDS blog, they're on the, the home page. They're what we live by. And... Critically, what they're about is they're about starting from the user, starting with the user need, put users first, learn from the journey, don't keep reinventing the wheel. Move barriers aside, and really, really importantly, don't try and do everything yourself, because you can't. Look at what's out there, look at what people are already doing, engage with the community. One of the weird things which I found in government was, so my background, 
a little bit of background. So I've been a CIO, Chief Information Officer, on a num in a number of government departments, and um, intermittently, uh, when no one else seemed to be around for the job, I was a CIO on London 2012. Um, massive great projects, huge complex things. I go out and I go to events like this one, and I'd be the only person from government who'd be at these events. I'd be the only person who was a CIO, forget government, public sector or private sector, I'd be the only CIO at these kind of events. I think, why is that? That can't be right. So one of our key points is engage. Because if we don't engage, then all we're left with is the world as it currently exists. So many of you will be familiar with one of our key products, which is GovUK. And GovUK is a kind of um, an exemplar of the approach we take in general to life. So at GovUK, we started from user needs. Um, we actually built a tool, it's an open source tool, it's on GitHub, uh, which is called the Needotron. Um, and uh, essentially what that is, is it's a tool for gathering needs. Basically it's like a card sorter, you put your needs in, it allows you to vote them up, vote them down, put it all together. We started with user needs. And what was really fascinating about GovUK was that an awful lot of our thinking, an awful lot of our assumptions at the start about how things should be, turned out to be wrong. Because when we put in front of users, what they wanted was something very different. So one of the key things for us actually, which has been one of the key bits of learning, is about humility. Which is that it's very easy to start off and go, this is the right answer, this is the right solution. It's only when you put it in front of users, it's only when you actually get real people testing it, you discover that actually the assumptions which I'm making are just my assumptions. So GovUK is now um, almost, almost more popular than the Guardian website. Keep tra tracking the uh, traffic, but we, we get um, about uh, we get an awful lot of visitors. And what's really important about it is that the whole thing's been built around that user need, and we built it from scratch. We actually built the entire CMS from scratch, and that was not a, a lightly taken decision. You know, we looked at what was out there. But for our needs, it came down to build was the right solution. And it's been built, it's open source. Um, people use Markdown to actually contribute to it. So all the content created in Markdown, put into the system. Okay. One of the other things which is kind of important about the new vision of what we're trying to achieve is being open. Okay. And it's not just about kind of open standards or open source even. It's also about being open about what we're doing and how we're doing it. So one of the weird things in government is um, it's always been really hard to work out whether or not you're actually delivering a good service or not. Or it's really easy if you've got a shop. Because if you're a rubbish shop, people don't come in and you go out of business. But we tend to be a monopoly provider. How do we know if our service is a good service? How do we know if people are using it? And how do we know how much it costs? So one of the big challenges we had was actually looking at government and going, how much do things cost? How much does it cost to deliver this particular service? So we build more and more tools. The performance platform is another tool which we've built. Again, it's open source. Um, and the very initial version of performance platform uh, essentially was um, really just a series of um, uh, forked D3 libraries which we created to do representation of particular information. But now it be, it's become a key thing. And this is all online. You can actually go online. This is, this is a live website. You can actually go online and you can see how many people are using any government service at a particular moment in time. And you can see how much it's costing us. At the heart of what we're trying to do is transformation. Okay? We're trying to transform how we, in the public sector, deliver services, how we build those services, how we think about those services. One of the key challenges has always been that too often people will create a service and they hand it over to somebody else to run. And basically what we're saying to people is, no, services are living things, systems are living things. You think about Drupal, you know, it's a living thing, it's continually being cared, fed, watered, 
beaten. No, uh, not the last one. But it's continually being engaged with. Our systems and services, people tend to go, we've built this thing, and now we're just going to leave it. So transforming culture is really important. There's also a big fear factor, which is just because something doesn't work, if it's still the way we've done it always in the past, there's a comfort around that. It can be quite frightening. Change is a frightening thing. Any kind of change is a frightening thing. And getting people to move out of their comfort zone and go, actually, you know what? We are willing to engage with the open source community. We are willing to engage with the agile, iterative approach to service delivery. It requires people to shift quite a long way out of their existing comfort zones. So an awful lot of what we're about is about helping people through that transition. Part of the way we're doing that is we've got this thing called the Exemplar Program, which is the thing which I'm currently working on, where we've got eight departments, we've got 25 public services which we're working on. Okay? And we're working on them in new ways. Okay? So one of the ones which I'm doing is the new um, individual electoral registration service. Okay? The way you register to vote at the moment is card comes through the door once a year addressed to the head of the household. It's a lovely Victorianism there. The head of the household who um, then writes down the name of everyone who lives in the house. Okay? Um, and that's how electoral register is created. Now, in a digital age, that seems a really weird way of going around things. So we're building this new individual electoral registration system where individuals, we as individuals, register to vote. Okay? In the same way we do loads of other services. And again, we're building this in a new way. I've got a small team who are building it. It's been built, open source, open standards. It's been continually iterated. It's been continually tested. We just completed a um, large round of testing with um, students. Move around a lot. We've just had people over in uh, France and Brussels uh, working with overseas voters, look at how it works for them. Because again, this needs to be led by users. It needs to meet user need. And again, that's quite a big shift. In fact, it's a fundamental shift. It's a radical shift, focusing on the user. In the past, the way we would have done this thing is we would have said, oh, large SI systems integrator. How much will it cost to deliver this? And they would go, I don't know, 50 million. Actually, no, it's quite complicated. Let's say 100 million. We go, okay then. Now I've got a team of about a dozen who built this thing. It's a fundamental shift. It's a fundamental thing. The only way we can do that is by making use of the tools, the power of the open source community. Okay? So, you know, half the emails I get, which is a bit worrying actually, half the emails I get are from Jenkins saying someone's broken the build. That's not a good thing. Um, unfortunately, my suggestion that we should link Jenkins, fit all our devs with electric shock collars, <laughs> link it to Jenkins, you break the build. For some reason, there's been a bit of pushback on that. I don't say why. Um, but without the power of tools, open source tools, like Jenkins, like Puppet, Without the power of open source development languages, you know, like Ruby, without Postgres, we'd be in a very different place than where we are now. It's only because we can build on those building blocks that we can actually achieve things. And that's part of the reason why we put our stuff back out into the community through GitHub. So, what's the approach we take? Well, We've written this thing called the Government Service Design Manual. It's brilliant. Uh, well, I was today, wouldn't I? But basically, it is a very good one-stop shop to think about how you build stuff. And it starts from who are you, what you're trying to achieve. So if you're a developer, if you use a researcher, if you're a web ops person. Actually, I always think web ops. It should really be pronounced webops, because it's like bebop, isn't it? You know, so it should be webops. Um, anyway. Yeah, I'll get some pushback on that one as well. Um, but we also set out our approach to getting things done. Start small, start with discovery. What's this thing I'm trying to achieve? Alpha, beta, 
live. Okay? It's that whole process of continual delivery, continuous integration, continual thinking about how we do stuff. Highly recommended. As I said before, we rely on standards, we rely on the community to make things happen. Okay? So there's a whole section in the manual about open standards, about how to use them and what we do with them. Okay? Um, and that's Um, and we've got some principles about open standards, okay, which are all set out in the guidance. Okay, and how do we, what do we mean by an open standard? Well, it's one which is based around collaboration. It's one which is transparent. How has it been developed? What does it mean? It's been built for a due process. There's fair access to it. Okay? So there aren't kind of weird licensing terms or you don't have to pay huge amounts of royalties or whatever for it. And it's supported by the market. Okay? So you can actually kind of use it and buy it and engage with it. And most importantly are kind of the rights to that particular kind of standard. So, you know, rights are essential to implementation of the standard and for interfacing with other implementations adopted the same standard. And they should be licensed on a royalty-free basis. That's compatible with both open source and proprietary software. So you can link things together. And these rights should be irrevocable unless there's been a breach of license conditions. So that's really important to us. So how do we make this stuff, make sure this stuff happens? How do we drive government? All the stuff I'm talking about, you might think, well, it sounds nice, but how do you make that happen? Well, as well as the carrots, we have sticks. Okay? And the fundamental stick we've got is something called the service standard. Okay? All this stuff is online. It's all public. It's all in the public domain. Every service which people want to go live, anywhere in the public sector, which has over 100,000 users per annum, has to pass the service assessment. And a service assessment in there is very clearly stated have you built it? What's the code? Is it open source? Is it open standard? How are you releasing it? Not only do we publish the, um, the standard, we actually publish the assessments against the standard, which is a slightly scary thing. Okay? So we're being really open about what we're doing. Um, anyway, just a quick reminder for anybody who's kind of forgotten. Um, but of course, the great thing about the open source community is it's all about choice. So, um, you know, we should, we should be very clear about that. Um, so, um, just last thing to say about standards. Um, we've created something called a standards hub. The standards hub essentially is a place where we engage with people, the world, about selecting the open standards for UK government IT. Okay? And again, it's completely open. Um, and basically we go out and we say, people, give us your suggestions about areas we should be focusing on. Okay? What, are the, what are the things that actually matter? And then we ask the community, we ask the world, how do we respond to that? What are the things which we actually do in that space? Okay? All online. Right, anyway. We're here to talk about Drupal. Sorry, that's, that's better. We're here to talk about Drupal. Okay. So, um, we do actually use Drupal um, because the approach we take is very much around finding the right tool for the, for the job. Okay. It's about pragmatism, ruthless pragmatism sometimes. So, this is um, a small um, but delightful, perfect uh, little service, little site which was built using Drupal okay, by uh, an SME. And this is something called the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service. Um, and actually, this is, this is it's not a massive, great transactional service in government terms. It's not a massive, high-profile service. But actually, it's one which really matters to the people who are involved. Okay? Because this is actually about recognizing the good work which people have done in supporting the voluntary sector. And we built this site. And it's clear, it's simple, it's straightforward, it's easy to use. 
The great thing about Drupal is we didn't have to worry about how the underlying technology was going to work. We didn't have to worry about anything apart from how did we meet the user need. And that's really powerful. But it's not just about the front end, it's not just about websites. So, Office of Public Guardian. Previously I showed you something called Lasting Power of Attorney. Lasting Power of Attorney, some of you might know about. It's kind of like a living will. It's a document you fill in in case you're incapacitated um, and you need someone, you know, and you need someone to take charge of your affairs. Really important. Okay? So we work in the Office of Public Guardian. One of our exemplars is Lasting Power of Attorney. We put the form online, okay? but it only takes us so far. We need to transform the back office as well. So the back office transformation okay, is actually being done using Drupal as the framework to enable that back office transformation. And it covers a lot. It covers a whole raft of things. Okay? We've got to integrate scanners into the process, we've got case management, we've got workflow, we've got case agent screens for people who are doing the work, we've got users reporting, integration, loads of things. And at the heart of this is Drupal. And that's what we're using as the glue to bind together all the various bits of the components, all the various parts of this process. Okay? So again, for us it's really important that we have the ability to engage with community because we are using the outputs of the community. We're in get, you know, and we're also feeding back in because the stuff which we're building for this, as I said before, we'll be releasing back out under open source license. So it'll be on our GitHub repository. People can fork it. People can do, you know, build on it. Because again, that's the great thing about this space, which is we can continually improve the tools which we collectively can use. So that's enough talking from me. Um, small amount of time for questions. Sorry, that's the wrong slide. I do apologise. Um, questions? And of course it would be the man at the back. Okay, so um, to take those in uh, reverse order. So, uh, so the question was, um, so GDS doing good stuff. Um, why haven't we managed to fix universal job match and uh, what's happening with universal credit? Okay, so um, on universal credit, um, we have been engaged with colleagues from DWP on that program. Uh, DWP colleagues are now taking the lead on that program and uh, we wish them all the best. Um, <laughs> and we will continue to support them uh, in the delivery of this program. Uh, you can find the full text of our written statement online. Um, Universal job match. Uh, universal job match actually is an interesting one because universal job match. Um, they made a decision which, on the face of it, was a really good decision, which is if you're doing job matching, if you're doing kind of looking for work, why build it yourself when there are people in the market who deliver that service? So they went out and they engaged with one of the very very big providers who deliver that service. I think it's fair to say that the outcome of that process has not been as optimal as perhaps we might have expected. Um, which is quite interesting actually because we have this kind of, uh, sometimes I have this naive view that the private sector is magic and it does these things and it's all wonderful and then we actually engage with a major private sector provider and this is their core business, this is actually what their business is and we discover actually, hmm. Yeah. So, um, universal job match, 
Um, again, the process for uh, improving universal job match is being led by our colleagues in DWP, and uh, we fully support um, and uh, wish them all the best. At the front now. That's a good question. So how can SMEs actually work with us? So um, we're really, really keen to encourage people to work with us. So we spend an awful lot of time working with our colleagues in um, government commercial services, Crown Commercial Services, sorry, as they're currently called, um, to take away a lot of the red tape, a lot of the pain, because it used to be trying to engage with government was kind of like, we managed to achieve some kind of weird perfection where it was incredibly painful for people trying to sell to us, and it's incredibly painful for us trying to buy things. And that requires some doing, really. We're kind of penalising both sides. So what we've now done is we've created... So a number of you know about G Cloud? People know about G Cloud? So we created G Cloud, first of all, as a way of a framework for buying cloud services. Okay? And as part of G Cloud, G Cloud's organised into lots, one, two, three, four, um, basically infrastructure, platform, software as a service, and lot four, which is kind of support services, how can we implement it? And what we discovered, actually, was that people were really keen to use lot four for things. So we've now built something called a digital services framework, DSF. And DSF, essentially, is basically what we're saying to people is, get on it, okay? It is, um, all, you need is all you need is a Dun & Bradstreet number um, and uh, the ability to set out what it is you actually do. Um, and it needs to have something to do with like digital services so um, if you're kind of like selling I don't know bacon sandwiches for example um, it might not necessarily get onto the framework but basically so we've just done the first round of the DSF okay um, and we're learning from it you know I mean not going to say it's perfect we're learning from it so we're going we'll be going out shortly the next round G Cloud Lot 5 has just opened so, again, if you're offering cloud services or services around the cloud, get onto that. Again, it's really simple, really straightforward. Um, we have um, groups who are going out doing kind of outreach sessions, running workshops, kind of apply camps for people, actually walking through, people through how you actually get onto the framework. Do that. Because we keep saying to people, um, there's an alternative. And their first question is, okay, how do I buy the alternative? And we need to go... It's easy, you just go here. So that, 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 that's the short answer. G Cloud, the cloud based services, DSF. And you know, if you run into any problems, then let us know. Because we want to make this as slick and easy as possible. Because the less pain there is on your side, the less pain there is on our side. So G Cloud, I think G Cloud has just hit. Um, I have to be really careful here because I'm not, I, 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 don't, I don't have the up-to-date figures, so I'm going to quote a figure which will be completely wrong, and that will get into the press, and the press will go, government spokesperson says G Cloud has saved. Um, I think, and I'll have things thrown at me for saying this, I think we're up to about 100 million. That could be completely wrong. In fact, it is completely wrong. So you can say government spokesperson gives completely wrong answer to the question. The short answer is I don't know. But um, we've got a clear target, which is, by, you know, which is that um, we expect um, the American, American government got their cloud first kind of thing. We haven't been as grandiose as that. We haven't given it a name, called it cloud first. We've just basically said to people, here's G Cloud, use it. And it's the kind of default route. So, you know, any figure I gave you would just be me making something off the top of my head. So I'm not going to do that. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. At the back.
Yeah, so, um, so the question is, how do, we, um, how do we educate people in how to use G Cloud, in particular to actually um, be able to contextualize what their needs are in a way that they can go out to G Cloud and say, who can meet my needs? And that's a big challenge, to be honest. It's a big cultural challenge because um, what we've created over the years has been like a procurement sausage machine. Um, and it grinds and it grinds and it grinds. And so what we're doing as part of our emphasis on user needs is saying, stop. Okay? We're not buying massive great systems, massive great services. Okay? What we have is we have a need. Can we articulate that need? That's the first thing. If we can't articulate it, then we're wasting our time anyway. Yes, we can articulate a need. Right, fine, okay, we can articulate our need. Okay, what do we do now? How do we, what's the best way of moving into market engagement with that need? So we've got teams of people going out. We have um, something called the controls process, which we run, where basically anyone in government who wants to spend um, anything over 5 million on technology or 100K on digital has to get our approval. And the very first question we ask is, what's the user need? And what's your approach to market engagement? How are you actually going to articulate this need? So that's the kind of stick bit. The carrot bit is we're going out, we're talking to departments. Part of the exemplar, part of the transformation program, which I'm working on at the moment, is about talking to departments, actually saying, stop. You know, we're not doing a technology-led project. We're not doing a kind of vague project, you know, we're doing, here's a user need, delineated, here's how we're going to eat the elephant bite by bite, and this is how we're going to engage with the market. It's not going to happen overnight, you know, I mean, it is, it is kind of super tanker, super tankers, but that's the approach we're taking. Anyway, I'm about to be thrown off stage, okay? <laughs>